Okay, <coughs> let's start. Good morning. Bonjour to to Le Mans. Now we are going to deal with the last part of chapter eight, which deals with optical submarine systems and their applications. After the coffee break, I think we shall start with uh, the chapter number nine, which is the system in the access network. By the way, the presentation is going around on a USB stick. You can copy it, of course. Optical fiber system for submarine application could cover very different uh, aspects. We can have uh, submarine cable system covering distances of a few kilometers. Think, for example, of uh, connection to islands just offshore or connections to uh, petroleum platforms just offshore, or they can cover thousands of kilometers between Europe and the United States in America, or between uh, Asia and uh, America, or between uh, Africa and uh, Europe and Asia and so on. Uh, summary cables uh, are uh, a special kind of optical system, of course, because uh, when you lay the summary cables, it goes to 3,000 meters under the sea. And as you can understand, it's very difficult to take it out to repair. So. The submerged plant should have a very high reliability, which is to be designed since the beginning of the project. And moreover, the design should be addressed to a very long operational lifetime. It's to lay an optical submarine cable and optical summary system, it's a very costly operation so that uh, you must have the system working at least for 25 years. This is normally the period of life which is uh, the starting point for the assumption of the design. The also, this difference reflects also on the structure of the recommendation. Yesterday we, we saw a few recommendations. Actually, we saw the results of uh, a few recommendations for systems in the terrestrial network. And the results were uh, given in the form of some tables saying uh, you can get this distance with these properties, this fiber, and uh, this number of channels. If you, on the contrary, take a, lo a look of any recommendation on optical fiber system for submarine application, you will see that there are parts which are related not only to the electrical and optical characteristics, but also to the mechanical and reliability characteristics and to the tests that have to be made during all the phases of the realization, which means from manufacturing of the single pieces to the final acceptance test, 
which will start the operational life of the system. That means that you do not simply buy, let's say, a submarine cable. Please sell me a submarine cable. No, you order a submarine cable and you follow the construction in the plant. You go there every week, every two weeks, to see what is the construction status. And during the construction, you verify if the shield is the proper shield, if the fibers are the proper fibers, if the length, which usually is 30 kilometers of a cable in a single piece, are those that were recommended and were ordered. So the, you have to pay a lot of attention to the manufacturing phases of any components in the system. Another important difference is that while for terrestrial systems we have recommendations that ensure the, for example, the transverse compatibility. That means I will connect a system from vendor A on site one to a system from vendor B in site two. For the submarine cable, the vendor will be just one and will be a turnkey system which means that the vendor will take care of any phase from production to laying of the system. A single company, a single vendor, will provide anything which is needed to link the two terrestrial interfaces on the two terminal ends of the link. Moreover, whereas for a terrestrial system, you can start from a minimum installation and uh, during the course of the years, you can upgrade the system. I mean, uh, we decide to put between site one and site two a system consisting of uh, 80 wavelengths in the uh, bands uh, C plus L. We are not obliged to start with 80 wavelengths. We buy the system which is able to transmit 20, uh, 80 wavelengths, but at the beginning we can equip it just with four or eight wavelengths because our traffic requirements are those. For submarine system, you have to design the summary system for the end of life capacity and you have to deploy all the entire capacity at the time of laying the system for the first time. This is a completely different approach from terrestrial systems. Yesterday, all over the day, we were looking for compatibility between or among systems, which means that we spoke about longitudinal compatibility or transverse compatibility. Summary system should not be compatible. They should only connect, they should only link terminal equipment A with the terminal equipment B, which is uh, 6,000 kilometers apart, for example. So ITU does not specify any particular application code. There is no compatibility to be compliant with. 
But most important, during the design phase, the pre-design phase, let's say, it's the identification of any involved parameter and of the characteristics that have to be carefully defined for each link. This is a, a joint effort. The submarine cable should be specified of common intent between the operators and the suppliers. And with the, in mind just one main objective, which is to achieve all the, quali all the quality objectives which are required by the design. What's that uh, during the course of the years, some of the recommendations can be withdrawn because they do not apply anymore or can be updated with the new version, with current version. This normally happens at the beginning since the uh, change of the technology is very fast so that a recommendation needs to be updated with uh, a new with a new edition, let's say, in a two years or four years period. As you can see, the list has grown in the years. The first installation of uh, optical submarine cable is dated back to the uh, late 80s. In uh, 20 years, the list of recommendations has grown very, very fast, covering all the new technology, technologies, including high bitrate WDM. Uh, what is to be said is that many of the technologies that were initially developed for submarine applications to extend the reach or to extend the reliability or to extend the bit error rate, in the course of the years can be incorporated also in terrestrial system. This is the case, for example, of the forward error correction code, the FEC, which was, which was developed at the beginning for submarine application and now has been incorporated in the OTM. We can have for the some what uh, for the technologies for the topology, sorry, for the architecture, let's say, of the submarine system, we can have different kinds of topologies. We run from point to point to star, to branch star, trunk and branch, festoon, ring and branch ring. Now we are going fast through each one of them. This is the point to point technology. It's very simple and uh, we have uh, two terminal stations, TS stays for terminal station, and uh, we have uh, terminal transmission equipment, bidirectional terminal trans tram, uh, transmission equipment, which are linked by a single link. The link shown is very simple, it's only a cable, of course, if you are requested to set up a system which is 1,000 kilometers long, you should have repeaters or amplifiers. Now, I think that we... This is a star topology in which a main terminal station is serving a number of other 
terminal station by means of dedicated links, which means by which means through separate cables. The traffic is transmitted by any transmission terminal equipment of the main terminal station to the other transmission terminal equipment in the other stations. Of course, this is a very costly solution because you have to lay different cables. In the example, we have uh, three different cables. You have to lay three different cables going to remote locations. It does not use it very uh, many times, this configuration. This is the most used configuration, which is the branched star topology. What does it mean? That uh, we have uh, to connect uh, a main terminal station with uh, a number of different terminal stations, in the example, three terminal stations. We can have a branch unit underwater, to have the splitting underwater. With respect to the previous topology, we can see that we can save cable when in the first part of the line, because we use just one cable instead of three in the example, to reach the branching unit. This is the common topology, the normal user topology. For example, coming from United States to Europe, you can have a branching unit somewhere near the shores of uh, uh, Europe and we have uh, one branch going to England, the other one going to Spain. Of course, it requires a branching unit which must be reliable to avoid the water penetration. This is another topology which resembles the bus structure of the terrestrial system and uh, it is uh, uh, called trunk and branch topology in which several terminal stations are connected to a single trunk by means of branching unit. We see that we have here Let's say this one is the origin terminal station. We have just one cable going to the other end. And during the link, we have some splitting of fibers going to other terminal station. Of course, we can use still the uh, technology of add and drop by which traffic going from this terminal station to this one is going this way, but we have some traffic which is originated here, which is going here and here. So we can have a complex topology and we can have interconnection between, among all the terminal station you see in the picture. It depends, of course, it depends on the capacity required at each uh, terminal uh, station. Of course, uh, for a summary system, you don't have a very high fiber count in the cable. While for terrestrial system, you can have cables with 96, fi 96 fiber inside. Normally, for uh, submarine cables, since you have to reduce the size to have uh, higher reliability and so on, the number of uh, fibers is kept to a minimum, let's say 
a normal figure could be 12, 12 fibers. So that uh, with uh, a so low count of fibers, you have uh, just one fiber or a pair of fibers split at each branching unit. This is uh, another topology, which is, uh, in a sense, uh, completely different from what we saw until now, because uh, here the uh, submarine plant is given only by the cable. All the terminal stations are on land, and uh, you don't have any repeater into the water. You have a terminal station in a point, and you have another terminal station, the following one, which is, for example, 200 kilometers apart, and you have the cable which is laid in the sea but, or in the lake, but no active element underwater. What is uh, the main reason for such kind of application? It is uh, a very fast deployable technology. If you have to back up the trunk network, the terrestrial trunk network, this is a very fast way to back up it with high capacity link. It requires less time to lay a cable in the sea than to excavate a trench in the land and to put the, the cable in the land. By the way, this uh, type of topology was invented by us. I mean, was invented at the Ministry of Communication of uh, Italy because we had uh, a stringent exigence. We, we had a problem. We had to host the World Championship in 1990, and uh, our network was, had no capacity to um, fulfill all the traffic requirements by journalists, uh, uh, TV, and so on. And uh, it was very late. The, the game uh, had to start June 1990, and we were uh, uh, nine months before, so there was no time to, uh, to lay terrestrial cables. So we invented this technology. Mainly was uh, Mr. Lattanzi, which was uh, the head of the uh, office at the Ministry of Communication, but I was involved as well. And uh, after designing the system, which required uh, joint uh, engineering efforts, which means uh, we uh, took the ITU recommendation only a, as an example, but uh, we tried to get the best from transmitter and receiver so that to have a very long spans, we could succeed in deploying the system from Genoa to Salerno, which is about 200 kilometers south of Rome, in three months. We had everything laid in three months. After uh, that experiment, the topology became uh, very popular and was uh, laid uh, between Portugal and uh, France and the United Kingdom. And also there is uh, an example of a festoon along the western coast of Africa. There are uh, an installation of a festoon. Moreover, you can invest on the cable and you can save money for upgrading. You will upgrade the terrestrial equipment only when needed. The only requirement is put a cable in the sea of adequate capacity. The equipment at the beginning could be very low capacity equipment and can be upgraded during the course of the years.
Another topology is the ring topology in which, to, in which we have uh, some terminal station which are connected by a cable laid uh, as a ring. This topology has the advantage that it can survive to a single failure, which is a single cable cut. If you have a point-to-point -point link between Africa and Europe and the cable is damaged in some part, all the traffic will be stopped. But if you have such a topology, Let's say if the nor, normally the traffic goes the way, this way, but if this cable is broken, you can have the fact that the traffic is sent back and can reach its destination by taking the reverse way. Of course, it is a costly system because you have to install double capacity. You have to install a number of fibers, which is the double of the required fiber. Any failure can be detected by an automatic measurement system, and the switchover can of the ring topology. The name is branched ring topology. And uh, with respect to the previous topology, you can see that uh, some branching units have been added in the ring so that we don't have uh, all the uh, terminal station on the ring, but we have uh, terminal station which are connected to the ring through branching Two branching, two branching units. A second time, you can have the second part of the ring. So it can be laid in two consecutive phases when traffic requirements are increased or when other terminal stations are to be added. The design of optical submarine systems has been changed very heavily by the technology evolution of systems. For example, WDM technique has been introduced as well optical amplifiers, dispersion accommodation and FEC. To make a comparison, the first optical cable to be laid in the Atlantic Ocean at the end of the 80s was a system with just one channel per fiber pair. The fiber pair was used in the two directions and the bit rate was 280 megabit per second. Also, in uh, this number, you can see what is a joint engineering approach, because 280 was not an official bit rate. It was simply the double of the official bit rate, which was 140, so that the special purpose multiplexer was developed to increase the capacity of the link, since uh, the other level, which was uh, 565, could not be transmitted at that time because of uh, the impairments of the link. A few years ago, a WDM system has been deployed on transoceanic link with a total capacity of 128 channels per fiber, each channel running 10 gigabit per second. So you can see is a total capacity per direction of 1.28 terabit per second. So it is clear now that uh, 
optical submarine systems are in some way out of specification. They are built on purpose, taking the existing technologies and pushing them to the upper limit in order to save money. Where well, save money simply means to have a low cost per transmitted bit. Dollar per bit should be very low figure. The main recommendation for repeated optical submarine systems, you can have both the repeated and unrepeated, which means a single span optical system. For repeated optical submarine system, the relevant recommendation is the G.977, which defines all the characteristics of the system which are needed to guarantee the performance, which is the bit error rate you have to reach. Guarantee the reliability, which means how the system can reach end of the life after 25 years with the reduced number of faults, and guarantee the capacity of gradability. In the recommendation also defined are the submerged equipment, which means the repeaters, the branching unit, and the, the equalizer. I will insist in a few seconds on the uh, meaning of equalizer. Moreover, the recommendation gives mechanical and electrical characteristics beside the optical one, and uh, how to uh, have monitoring systems to supervise the working of the system and to locate faults if any fault occurs, and moreover also the reliability. What is an equalizer? Did you add an introduction to equalizers when uh, dealing with the com components or not? Well, what is a, an audio equalizer? An audio equalizer is an equalizer in an audio equipment which is able to modify the transfer function of the amplifier in order to selectively uh, increase or reduce the content of uh, some frequencies. Normally is uh, to be used whenever the amplifier has a response which is not completely flat or to compensate for the, um, the audio characteristics of the room. If you have a room that uh, absorbs one frequency, that frequency is to be increased in the amplifier in order to have uh, it to reach the ear as all the other ones. Well, why equalizers in optical systems? Because in optical systems we have amplifiers as well. And if you have a look of the transfer function of an optical amplifier, you can see immediately, you can uh, go back to chapter number five, and you can see that uh, the frequency response of the erbium doped amplifier is not flat, but is going this way. That means that s some frequencies will be amplified less, other frequencies, or wavelength if you prefer, will be amplified more. If you have a long sequence of amplifiers, this effect could increase dramatically. You could have also differences of many dBs in the output power at the various wavelengths. To avoid this problem, 
some sort of equalizer is inserted along the line, which simply means to have uh, the channels which add uh, higher gain to have uh, an added attenuation in order to have a flat response, a flat overall response. This is an example of uh, how a submarine system can be constructed. You have uh, two terminal stations here on the main link, branching unit, a third terminal station, and uh, inside, along the line, you have the repeaters, which are actually active repeaters. They have to be powered. And you can have also systems repeaterless, in which there is uh, just one span, a, si a single span. Concerning uh, cables and fibers, I don't want to enter into details because is out of the scope of this part and of this tutorial, but mainly we have a different kind of cables according to the region where they are going to be laid. The most dangerous part of the submarine plant is the part which is nearest to the coast because the cable is laid in shallow water and there is a risk that um, the fishermen going with the nets to fish will uh, keep the, the cable and will uh, break it. As soon as you go into the deep sea, you can have uh, lighter cables with no shields, because a cable which is laid 3,000 kilometers below the sea level is between brackets safe. Nobody will, will touch it. To enter into more details, we shall now see to a picture showing the composition of uh, an optical uh, submarine transmission system. We start from the terminal transmission equipment, which is uh, the part of the system in charge of uh, transmitting and receiving information from uh, at one end, the, te the TT is linked to the terrestrial network. The traffic is coming from the terrestrial network and the, in the other direction is going to the terrestrial network. On the other side is connected to the CTE, which is the cable terminating equipment, which is the interface between the TTE with its fiber and the submarine cable arriving from the sea. Moreover, this cable terminating equipment has also the function to insert into the cable the power, electrical power, I mean, which is required to feed to feed all the equipment, the active equipment in the sea. This kind of uh, station, the power feeding uh, equipment, uh, has the name PFE, of course. Uh, for uh, what concerns power feeding, power feeding is normally obtained sending a high voltage along a metallic 
part of the cable which is uh, generally at the, the center of the cable. The return part is provided by the sea itself. It's just like in railways in which the return is provided uh, either by the trucks or by the earth. The branching unit, as we saw before, is uh, a unit which stays under the level of the sea and which is used to contain uh, more than two cables which are joined inside the branching unit. The Power feeding equipment uh, provides, as we already said, all the power which is needed to feed the repeaters. This is the general schematics of uh, the system. We have the land session, this one, terminal equipment, interface between the cable and the fibers out of the terminal equipment, power feeding equipment, and maintenance controller. This maintenance controller is the supervision system which going into the cable has a map of the cable and can understand if any fault is going to happen in a short while. We have uh, some repeaters in line, a branching unit which is going to another terminal station through other repeaters. So the, the layout is very, very simple. This is a trunk and branch configuration and uh, any section, any section be between two consecutive repeaters is called the supervisory section. The supervisory system is able to detect what is going on in each supervisor's supervisory section. The supervisor's supervisory section includes the fiber and half of the repeat in each end. The elementary cable section includes only the cable. Any questions? High uh, voltages in order to, to have less, uh, less loss, losses. Repeaterless system, no repeater underwater. This kind of system is defined in recommendation G.973 and uh, uh, both single channel and multi channel system are included in the recommendation. This kind of system has very high reliability since there is uh, no active element in the, um, in the submarine plant. There is uh, an effect on the cost. The cost is very low compared to the other, is not very low in general, but is lower than the other solution because we don't need any power feeding of repeaters and we don't need any supervision because we can have a monitoring of the fiber just front of the cable, just from one end by means of a conventional monitoring equipment. We can have high capacity, which means high number of fibers because uh, we are not uh, constrained in dimensions. We were speaking before about uh, the capacity in terms of fibers in, 
in an optical fiber link, uh, summary in optical fiber link. I said that uh, normally there is a low fiber count. This is due to the fact that when you splice the fibers, you must have uh, a box which contains all the splices. And if you have uh, 96 fibers to be spliced, this box will be very large and cannot uh, incorporate it easily in uh, the cable. To have a box uh, in a cable is uh, just like to, to see a snake which has uh, just eaten an other, another animal. You have uh, this situation. This is the cable, this is the box. If you put 12 fiber, the box will be small. If you put 96 fiber, the box will be this one. So it's unpractical. Another advantage of repeaterless systems is the fact that you can pay as you grow. The initial cost is given by the cable, by laying the cable, but the equipment can be reduced with reduced capacity. When you need other capacity, additional capacity, you will put additional terminal equipment on the land. This is the definition of the interfaces for an optical repeaterless submarine systems. As you can see, in the water, or repeater it, which means you need some repeaters into the water. The first one, the repeaterless, it's better. Every time it's better. But you have a limited reach. This is the, the reach. This is the reach. 60 dB for 30 channels. This is an example, of course at 10 gigabit per second, which means 300 kilometers. Well, if the kilometers, instead of 300, are 400, you have to install a repeater. You are forced to install a repeater. And the system will be less reliable, more costly, and so on. But I am not recommending to use only repeaterless system. I am only saying that the repeaterless systems are better. Is it clear now or not? Well, let's go back. These are feeding equipment. I will show you the diagram. This is the optical fiber cable. At the center of the optical fiber cable, I have a metallic wire, which can be copper, for example. I have here the power feeding equipment. And one is connected to the copper. The other one is put into the water. Here we have the repeater. The copper is going to a load, 
and the other part is put into the water. So the current is going this way. Very simple. Of course, it's very simple to, to draw. It's not very simple to, to build it, but the basic, the basic system works in such a way. We have just one conductor, normally at the center of the cable, and the, re the return is via the seal. So, this is the basic diagram for a repeaterless optical summary system. You can see that the power budget is notable. 60 dB are a lot of uh, attenuation uh, which can be uh, in the cable. And uh, this kind of system is able to transmit as many as 30 channels, each one carrying 10 gigabit per second, which means 300 gigabit per second in total. And the maximum distance can be as high as 300 kilometers. To build such a system, we can use high performance error correcting codes, Raman amplifiers, remote optically pumped amplifiers, and specific type of fibers. Also different in the same link. What's the meaning? The meaning is that I can use fibers which have a positive chromatic dispersion coefficient in one section and a companion fiber which has a negative chromatic dispersion coefficient in the following section, which means that in the first section we, the pulse will broaden, in the second section will narrow, so that I am compensating in the line the chromatic dispersion. I should expect immediately a question from you. Why we don't use such kind of technology also for terrestrial systems? The reply is very simple. We can use it, but it's very risky because the optical cable for submarine application is laid in the water and it is it stays there forever. The terrestrial can be changed on a, a yearly basis, for example, because I have to pass another city or I have to modify the path because of a fault and so on. This means that you should have a database containing the composition of any cable which means that if the cable is broken at uh, kilometer 975, you should go to see which kind of fiber is there. Here you know, because this is a special purpose cable, so you can have uh, the allocation of the fibers along the cable, and you know which fiber to put inside when the cable is broken. Uh, broken, but moreover, in a summary cable, the reliability objects are such that you can have uh, three repairs in 25 years. No more than three repairs. Whereas for terrestrial cable, you have uh, one repair per year per, key, per uh, given number of kilometers, which is much more, of course. Other important points in these slides are the Raman amplifiers 
and the remote optically pumped amplifiers. Did you know what they are? Did you have an explanation of Raman amplifiers during chapter five or of uh, AeroPA during chapter five? A little bit, a little bit. Well, I think we can have our coffee now and I will draw something on the blackboard, uh, whiteboard. <laughs> on the whiteboard just after the coffee break to explain your Raman amplifiers. Okay. It's you to give an insight on these two aspects. Let, let we start from optical amplifier. This is a very simple optical amplifier. The amplifiers you buy are much more complicated because they have two laser pumps, isolator, and so on. But this, this is the very simple one, and I can use it to explain how it works. Here we have the input fiber carrying the signal we want to amplify. Inside the box, inside the amplifier, we have a special kind of fiber, which is a normal fiber in which we have added a dopant, which is normally the erbium, which is one of the rare heart uh, uh, material, and uh, we can uh, use uh, different dopants for different uh, bandwidth, but the first one was with the erbium. So I have uh, a piece of uh, fiber, let's say 100 meter, which is a special fiber. This is the signal. Moreover, I have a local laser, very powerful, for example, one watt, emitting at a suitable wavelength, for example, 980 nanometer, and the optical power from this laser, laser is coupled to the erbium fiber. If there is any physicist uh, in the floor, by means of these photons going inside, we will have some uh, particles which are um, which are go going up to higher level energy levels. When a photon coming from the signal traverses the fiber, the particle will go down again and will emit a photon which is exactly like the signal photon. So that I enter with one photon and I get two equal photons. I am amplifying. By the way, if I enter with one photon, I go out with uh, 1,000 photons. I am amplifying 30 dBs or 25. But this is the basic mechanism. Of course, for this pump laser to emit, I have to put a battery or connection to the power line. Well, how can we have a remote amplifier? It's very simple. I take this laser and I bring with me to the terminal station on the land. So that in the fiber, I will let both the signal and the pump power. When they arrive in the special field of a fiber, but this is a fiber, it's not a, a box, it's not nothing. It's a field of fiber which is spliced along the line the power will be amplified. So I take a normal amplifier and I take the pump and I move the pump to the end of the link. So there is no need for the box, no, no need for the powering, because the powering is on land. Is it clear? Raman amplifier. The Raman amplifier is a little bit different. This, this is the fiber carrying the signal. And this is the receiver. So 
I am on land. This is the receiver. This is a completely normal fiber. So by means of Raman amplifier, I can also upgrade the installed system. Because what I need is to have very high power laser here. And the power from this laser is injected in the fiber in the reverse direction. So I have a lot of photons going this direction and the signal going this direction. These photons, if this wavelength is suitable, are transferred to the signal. So the signal is amplified. I have some optical power which is transferred to the signal. What I need? I need a laser with 5 watt of optical power, which is a big laser. And nothing else. This, the fiber is a normal fiber, which maybe I installed 20 years before. So I have only to put the Raman amplifier at the receiving end. I can do it 